Uh, it is with great pleasure that I introduce my good friend and colleague, John Pate, uh, who is a professor here at the University of Michigan in the School of Public Health and Internal Medicine. And John uh, has been involved in technology for a good number of years and uh, is one of the individuals here who is really on the vanguard of implementing, assessing, testing technology in the implementation phases of technology and, and medical care. And so he is going to be here talking to us about uh, high tech and high touch advances in mobile health systems for managing mood disorders. So, uh, Dr. John Payne. Okay, so. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you very much. This is a, a huge pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, I see that they left uh, 45 minutes for my question, so I'm gonna try to be especially confusing and unclear <laughs> so we can really <laughs> make good use of all of that time. <laughs> uh, actually, no, I think we'll, we'll do just fine. How do you do this? Uh, we were just saying, me and Dr. Provost, we're, we're really curious who's here. I know there's people in the other room that I can't see, but just of the people here in this room, how many people are not either faculty or students at the University of Michigan? All right, great. Okay, well, welcome. So that actually gives me license to take two minutes and really brag about uh, you know, the work that we're doing here at UM in general in this area related to uh, bipolar disorder and depression. Uh, some of the work I'm going to touch on, and I'm gonna to touch on two really big ideas, big advances that we've been able to make here and are making to make mobile health systems uh, really work better for people with mood disorders. But before I get to that, let me brag about some of the uh, you know, other wonderful international work that we're doing. Uh, we already heard about uh, some of the work in Latin America. And uh, the medical school actually funds a large number of students to do international internships during the summer. And of course, that's good for the students and it's good for their, their host uh, country. They learn a lot, we learn a lot. It's really stimulated a lot of exchange. As you'll see, like, I develop mobile health systems, and I've uh, always come to this really, really, uh, from a practical perspective, using simple, simple mobile phones. Uh, and uh, we used to do studies with, with mobile health in Central America, here for, at the University of Michigan, with all of that infrastructure for making automated calls, living here at UM, and calling patients in rural areas of Honduras. We found, in, even though those interventions might have been focused on hypertension or diabetes, their depressive symptoms improved because patients, for the first time, were getting the type of attention and kind of empowering self-management information that they needed to stay well. This last year, we did something that we're really excited about. It was the first time that we were able to actually partner with another university, in this case in Bolivia, and transfer this technology from the University of Michigan to a site there. So we're able to really empower that country to do their own development of mobile health support. And we're specifically focused uh, now in some of our work going forward on mood disorders because mood disorders really lend themselves, of course, to the type of isolation, to the type of risk for suicide, to the need for assistance uh, with self-management uh, that works so well with mobile health. Uh, we already heard that uh, depressive disorders are very common uh, in uh, low- and middle-income countries. Uh, most suicides occur in low- and middle-income countries. Uh, and there's a couple of projects that we're, we're right now pursuing. Um, one related to suicide prevention, another related to using health workers that have been shown to be useful where there are not psychologists, psychiatrists, or social workers, and linking that with some of these mobile health tools. So, so it's been a real pleasure for me to be here at the University of Michigan where there's just been this great interaction between the people that have the great expertise about 
mental health and mental health management here in the Depression Center in our Department of Psychiatry and the people in the College of Engineering, some of the health services researchers in medicine, uh, in the public health school, and there's just lots and lots going on. So that's just my general uh, you know, bragging uh, to you about uh, all the things that I'm more than happy, uh, as I'm sure the other speakers uh, are, to talk with you more about what we're doing internationally uh, or some of the things that we're doing domestically that we're so excited about. Um, you know, I'm a little, always a little uh, uh, uncomfortable with this title. Uh, you know, on one hand, I like it. On the other hand, I kind of fit in the middle here. I'm not really as high tech or as kind of um, uh, yeah, sophisticated on the engineering side as Dr. Provost is, and I'm not really as high touch as our psychiatrist colleagues like Dr. Graydon and Dr. McGinnis and, and some of the others that are with us. So I'm kind of in the middle. And as I said, you know, so I always come from this in a very, very, very practical way. It's How do we? Uh, translation. Yeah, I do the translational piece, you know, yeah. <laughs> Interstitial translational piece. Trying to bring these services into communities, into the uh, populations uh, that need it the most. And, I'm, and I want to kind of talk to you today about a couple ideas that are trying to use more high-tech solutions, and specifically a couple ideas from this field of artificial intelligence and using these high-tech solutions to be more high-touch with our patients. So, so we can adapt services so they really meet the unique needs of each individual that has a mood disorder or is at risk for having a mood disorder. So that's the general idea. And one of the frames I'm going to, uh, to, to put that in is this. Now, I, I, I've known Dr. McGinnis for a while, so I figured he wouldn't mind if I, if I kind of you know, pick on him a little bit. But really, really, this is the goal. We want to use these technologies that we all come together here today to talk about, but we want to be more personalized. Now, I don't feel that I am equipped to tell you exactly why Dr. McGinnis is such a good psychiatrist. We certainly don't have time for that. But there are two specific things uh, that Dr. McGinnis does, that a good clinician does, that we're trying to do with more advanced health technologies to make systems that are much more personalized for individuals that use them. Okay, now, now let me back up and I wanna to talk to you about some of the work that we've done uh, for a number of years using mobile health tools. And this is really just uh, as kind of a context for some of the more advanced work that we'll be talking about uh, in a little bit. Okay, these are not, what you're gonna see Popping up on the screen, sorry, they don't pop up nice like they should, but these... They fade in and out. Huh? I, <laughs> yeah, I don't think they go. They just go, yeah, oh good. These, let me tell you what these are not. These are not studies that show that mobile technology is helpful with chronic disease. Each of these papers is a review of studies that show that mobile technologies can be helpful with chronic diseases, which is to say there are now hundreds of studies that show us that you can use text messaging here in the US, in uh, countries like Kenya, uh, Southeast Asia, to help people that have chronic disease identify when they're having problems, so there's this monitoring aspect, and to help them do the behavior changes that they need to do to say, well, there's studies of people with diabetes, studies of people with asthma, studies of people with um, chronic pain, and one of the areas, as it turns out, that there's more studies than anything else is psychiatry, showing that we can improve depression outcomes, uh, outcomes for obsessive compulsive disorder. We can help schizophrenic patients take their medication. It's really incredible, and it's kind of not intuitive that some patients that have really difficulty, a lot of difficulty organizing themselves, their cognition, actually are the ones that benefit the most from some of these low cost technologies. Now, my area isn't text messaging. I've always used what we call IVR, which is automated telephone monitoring and self-management support calls. These are like an outgoing call to your phone that works just like voicemail. Patients receive information. They answer questions on their phone. These are studies of just substance abuse showing that these sorts of calls can gather reliable information 
about really complex behaviors like substance abuse or um, substance abuse among patients with HIV. There's more evidence in this field of psychiatry than in almost any other field. This is just one study with 26,000 patients showing that you can reliably measure someone's depressive symptoms using an automated call, okay? There are other studies that I don't think I, uh, uh, oh yeah, here we go. Uh, patients' risk for suicide. Another thing that we now know we can reliably measure using low-end technology. This is not the fancy stuff. This is the stuff that we're all familiar with uh, and it goes very well. Now sometimes when I present uh, this, this topic in a group of people that are uh, health professionals, they go, no thanks, robocalls. I would hate that. But there's a big difference when you use them in these contexts. When we interact usually with an automated calling system, it's usually between us and something we want. Like, I just want to order my pizza, right? We <laughs> heard the person like yelling, oh, you know, I just want to know when the plane comes in. But when you're a patient that who's feeling vulnerable, doesn't have enough access to support, maybe can't get assistance in your own language, and something calls you, um, it's, it's a completely different experience. And when you report information to an automated system, and a nurse or a social worker or a psychologist calls you back and says, oh, wow, I see your depressive symptoms are getting worse. Now you know that in your hand, you have a way of communicating with your healthcare team that you never had before. So it's a completely different experience, and it's an area that we've been very excited about. The programs that we've developed are under this umbrella that we call the CARE Partner Program. We've developed it for a variety of different diseases. And, but the, the basic model and information flow is always the same. Patients get weekly assessments. They report information about their symptoms and their self-management behaviors. And three things happen. During that interaction, they get very specific advice, tailored advice about what they can do to stay well. So if someone's taking antidepressants and their depressive symptoms aren't getting better, they can say, you know, you might want to check in with your doctor. Hang in there, don't stop taking your medication. It sometimes takes a while for them to work. They get uh, tailored advice. In addition, the clinical team can get an automatic alert so they can identify patients that really need help. And the program is called Care Partners because patients often can enroll with a family member who also gets tailored feedback on their phone, maybe a text message, maybe a, a structured email, letting them know how their loved one is doing and what they can do to help. And these are particularly useful here in the U.S., where we often live far away from our social network, maybe from our parents. We, uh, I do a lot of work in the VA. We had one older gentleman who's a VA patient in Cleveland. He enrolled in our care partner program with his son who was in, on an army base in Guam. <coughs> right? So that facilitated this kind of bringing together the social network in this way, and it's been something that's been... Uh, uh, very attractive in a variety of chronic disease areas. This is a study where we had more than 1,200 patients with heart failure, with depression, with diabetes, with cancer, with chronic pain, lots of different diseases. And we found something really interesting. Older adults were actually more likely to complete these weekly calls than their younger counterparts. Okay? So we're often worried with technology about reaching older adults, but we found that these sort of uh, interactions are actually ideally suited for reaching uh, older adults here in the U.S. Okay? So far, so good. Now let's get to the part that's, that's complicated and why we need to do better. Okay, let me tell you a story. This is the digger wasp, and the digger wasp does something that's really complicated. Okay? Here's what the digger wasp does. A digger wasp, a female digger wasp, lays an egg, digs burrow, lays an egg. The egg hatches into a larva. The wasp has to go and get food and bring it back. Now, the digger wasp has co-evolved over millions of years with a spider that knows it's going to do this and goes down the hole waiting. Okay? So, the digger wasp is one step ahead. It comes back to the hole, it takes the food, and it puts it down at the edge of the hole, goes down and checks if the spider's there, the spider's not there, comes back, gets the food, brings it, brings it down, okay? 
That's this kind of uh, you know, complex behavior. For something that has a brain that's smaller than a period on the edge end of a page, that's a really complicated set of behaviors to get all in the right order and sequence. Okay? Very complicated. But there's something interesting. The digger, if when the digger wasp goes down a hole, take the food that's sitting there up by the top and you move it a, a centimeter to the left. The, the female digger wasp comes up and says, oh, I need to go get some food. And it goes over the oh, there's some food, and it gets the food, brings it back to the edge, goes down and checks if there's a spider. Now, if you take that food and move it a centimeter to the right, the digger wasp comes up and says, oh, I need to go get, oh, there's some food. And it goes, gets it, it brings it to the edge of the hole, goes down and checks, and comes back. You can do this 80 times, and the digger wasp will continue to say, oh, there's some food, and it goes down and checks. And it'll repeat the same. So the digger wasp is doing something very complex, but it's not very intelligent. Right? That's the distinction I want to make. Okay, so our, these automated calling systems that we use, this is the calling flow. You push this, it says this. You push that, it says this. This email goes there. And each one of these for depression, for heart failure, for all the other diseases we developed after lots and lots of meetings and lots and lots of trials with all the best experts, and we come up with something like this. It's our best guess. But at the end of the day, this is something that's very complex but it's not very intelligent. The automated systems that we develop are digger wasps. Right? And that's kind of in the state of the art in mobile health monitoring. You get a call every week, you answer questions, you get the call in the next week, and that's what we've been doing. And we think we can do better in two ways that take advantage of some of these specialized areas that come under the basic umbrella of what we call artificial intelligence. Okay? Some of you remember where that quote is from, I'm sure. Where'd that come from? It was the, where's the debate. Was it Walter, Walter Mondo? Carter. Carter. It was the Carter debate. Yeah. Right? And why was that such a cutting thing to say? There you go again. That was just, just devastating in the debate, debate because when you say there you go again, that implies your answer is a wooden response, you're not thinking of what's really happening here, you say that all the time. One of the worst things you can say when you're in a couple is that's just like you to say that, right? Most cutting means you're saying doing something that might be complex, but it's not intelligent at all. That's what we've been doing, is being like that, okay? So one of the areas that we think we can do better is this. And we looked at it specifically in our care partner program for people that have depression. Now, as I mentioned, um, in these programs, paid patients often get uh, uh, their, their depression symptoms monitored with the PHQ. Right? It's a common depression measure. And we ask them about things like their medication adherence. Okay? So let's pick on Dr. Graydon. So Dr. Graydon was in the, in, the, in the care partner program. And I called him every week with the automated call. And he, I said, Dr. Grant, did you take your medicine today? And he said, yes. And he's now said yes 40 weeks in a row. On uh, week 41, what do you think the chance is that Dr. Grant's going to say no? Very unlikely, right? Really unlikely. And that's, in fact, what we found, even on depressive symptoms. So let's focus over here. In these automated calls that patients get every week, they all have depression, we're monitoring them. Overall, 22% of the time, someone has moderate or severe depressive symptoms, okay? But if they had reported moderate or severe depressive symptoms the last time we called them, there's you know, about a 72% chance they're gonna report it today. And this is even more important. If they didn't have depressive symptoms the last time I called, right, 93% of the time, they're not gonna have it today. So just with that one bit of information, we have a pretty good idea of what someone's gonna say. Now, if we include other information about that person, like their gender, like their age, like their medications, like their comorbid diseases, we can often predict, right? Just like an old married couple, we can often predict what the person's gonna say before they even say it. 
Now that has two great benefits, right? One is it makes us more like Dr. McGinnis here, okay? If Dr. McGinnis had a patient and say, you know, he's had this woman as his patient for 25 years. And she came in today and she says, Mary, do you smoke? She says, Dr. McGinnis, I haven't smoked for 25 years. I didn't smoke when I saw you two months ago. No, I didn't pick up smoking today, right? That might be an important question, but he knows from basically what he's asked that person before, what's likely to be a problem and what's not. And he's gonna adapt that interaction to the person. The first time he saw Mary, she was a Caucasian, 55-year-old uh, uh, woman with depressive symptoms. After seeing her for 25 years, hopefully she's not that, hopefully she's married. And he's able to adapt to what he's doing, not only to make it more patient-centered, but to really identify the things that are going to be a problem. Okay. The other great benefit of that is that it allows us to use that time better. Now, if we're doing an automated interaction, we don't just want to gather information from the person. We want to give them help. We want to give them advice. We want to make sure they're plugged into care. We want to educate them about suicide and suicide risks. We want to help them with their uh, psychotherapy if they're in cognitive behavioral therapy. So now this opens up the opportunity. If we're not asking them all these same questions again and again and again, we can do better. So this is one of the areas that we're trying to do better. And this very complicated map is uh, from something called the Web of Science, and it shows basically who publishes with who across different di disciplines. And the closer you see the, the boxes, the more likely it is that that discipline publishes with the other discipline. And they do this, there's all those, you know, the published papers are online, and they use uh, uh, something called network analysis to make these webs and show who's talking to who. See something really, really interesting, okay? There's clinical medicine and psychology, right? There's engineering. Couldn't be farther away, okay? So one of the things that we're doing to solve this problem is here at the University of Michigan, we're bringing people from our College of Engineering together with the people here in the medical school, the School of Public Health, the School of Nursing, the School of Pharmacy, to solve some of these problems and to bring the complementary skills that everyone has together to make these interactions and these mobile health tools more patient-centered, more high-tech, and more high-touch at the same time. Okay, now, in addition to being more patient-centered, and kind of more adaptive, it's something that you know, makes you sound like you're listening to the person. There's the other great benefit for being adaptive and not asking a lot of useless, redundant questions is this, and it has to do with multimorbidity. We heard a little bit about cancer and depression already. This is data, uh, actually it happens to be from Scotland, it's from more than a million people in Scotland, and it shows of people who have this, who also has this. Okay, so you can see, for example, that uh, for people with diabetes, 24% of the people also had coronary artery disease. Okay, and where do you see the size of the bubble indicates two things that are really commonly associated. Where do you see the big bubbles? Pain and depression. Pain and depression, people with pain and depression often have other chronic disease, diseases like cancer, like pulmonary disease, like heart disease, like diabetes. So it's really a tricky thing when we're developing an intervention, an automated system, to know how to address all of these things that someone has going on at the same time. Okay, here's a quick illustration. This could be a very typical person, right? They have diabetes, they have depression and they have chronic pain. Common in the VA, sometimes I think that's half the patients at the VA. But very common combination. And within each of these areas, there's a lot of different things we would like to talk to the person about. Are they taking their medications? Are they checking their uh, glucose regularly? Are they um, practicing their cognitive behavioral therapy? Um, are they experiencing side effects? There's so many things that we would like to ask them about. But we have this problem of these limited, limited interactions. 
So just for the sake of argument, let's color code these. So we'll, um, you know, just give them each an individual color. And if we're calling someone every week with an automated call to kind of monitor how they're doing, this is what we wish we could do. Every week we call them, we wish we could touch on all of those 15 different things. And some of those might have five questions in them. We wish we could hit them all. But we never can do that. You'd have someone on the phone for an hour. Okay? So what we usually do, uh, at least for us researchers, is we say, oh, this is a diabetes intervention. Like the person has depression, like that's another study. And we ask them about five. And we do that again and again and again. And as you saw before, that might be really um, wasting our time. Okay? That's one thing we could do. Another thing we could do is we could ask them, kind of switch off every few weeks and ask them a little bit about this. But that's in a certain way just as brain dead as asking them every single week. Right? We might be missing asking some things too infrequently and other things too much. Um, if each of those areas has many questions in it, we could squeeze in a little of each. And now we're only asking them two questions from a depression um, uh, evaluation. That's not enough to really get a sense of how they're doing with that. We don't have a sense of how they're doing that. I mean, we're not doing well on anything. Those are the, currently the options. We think uh, we can do better. And we're going to do better by working with our colleagues in engineering to identify from each patient what is the actual correct frequency to monitor each of those 15 things so we don't miss anything that's really serious, but we're able to use that time as effectively as possible to monitor the whole range of health problems that they have and also save some of that precious time to give that person the self-management support they need. So each person might have an individualized schedule and using some of the techniques uh, to be able to predict what people are going to say based on what we know about them already, we think we're able to develop these um, adaptive systems so that we can actually use our contact time with patients much more effectively. So that's one thing we want to do. Uh, and then now let me let briefly touch on the other thing. Uh, there's another colleague uh, in engineering, uh, Dr. Satinder Singh. He's an expert in something called reinforcement learning, right? Another area that has a lot of potential, it's used in robotics, used to predict what the stock market does, uh, used to predict all kinds of things, but we've never used it in developing systems for how we communicate with people with depression or bipolar disorder. So what is reinforcement learning? It's actually something that's really, really simple, okay? You have an agent, that's the, the system here, that's interacting with a person, that's the environment, and it tries different things, and it gets feedback of, of what happened, right? And it starts to learn what works with each individual based on constantly getting feedback. So that's the general idea, okay? And, the, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, kind of new, as cutting edge as that seems, this is something all of us have lots and lots of contact with, and we just kind of don't know it. If you have Netflix, if you have Amazon, see that where it says rate this item, right? That's the system getting feedback from you on what works for you when it tries different sorts of books, and it's gonna then start to develop a pattern that really fits you. So from the millions of books it offers, it's offering you just what you need. That's basically the idea that we want to do with reinforcement learning. There's the roots of reinforcement learning, again, they're more common. This is, this is Satinder Singh uh, from engineering says, reinforcement <coughs> learning is like life. Reinforcement learning is how you learn how to ride a bike, right? When you fall down, you learn, oof, don't do that again, right? And you can start to adapt your behavior and fine tune it so that uh, you, know, you can use this experience more effectively. Now, reinforcement learning does something that's even cooler than that, okay? Now, in the, the most basic sense, I'd say I try something, and you'd say, bleh. I'd say, okay, let me try this, bleh. Let me try this, well, that works. Okay, I'm gonna do more of that. That's the base case, but reinforcement learning algorithms can do something even fancier. A lot of times in life, we don't get that feedback every time we try something, like in a chess game. You don't know you won until the end of the game. But that win was the result of many, 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 many choices and moves. Okay? Reinforcement learning algorithms can take advantage of all that experience 
just like Dr. McGinnis does. Okay? Dr. McGinnis, as a more experienced clinician, can help patients and give them advice, even though he might not necessarily see during that uh, visit or during next week or the week after whether that advice was right or not. Because he's able to use all the experience that he's developed over the years with that individual and with people like them to make the right decision over time. Right? And that's something called temporal credit reassignment. It's a fancy term that means that you're able to really see things downstream and use the experience that you've <coughs> developed over lots of time and lots of trials with lots of different things to make the best decisions. Right? So if we can use these sorts of techniques, we can develop automated systems that are now acting more like Dr. McGinnis. Right? They're making better decisions using, you know, in a way, wisdom from all the experience that they have. This is light years away from where we've been with calling patients every week or every time, you know, every night at five you get a little text message reminder that says you should take your antidepressant. It's a whole different world. But we're able to, by bringing together our colleagues in engineering with our colleagues that really um, understand what the problem is in important areas like depression or bipolar disorder, we're able to develop these adaptive interventions that are going to be much more patient-centered, much more efficient, and much more like something that someone's willing to use over the long term. Okay. We have uh, one of these reinforcement learning uh, uh, studies going on right now with um, something called M cubed, right? Everything at University of Michigan is M something, right? <laughs> M cubed means that you had to apply to the university with colleagues from three separate schools, right? So we have colleagues, uh, myself, in the medical school, someone in the College of Pharmacy, and Dr. Satinder Singh from the College of Engineering to develop a reinforcement learning text message system that can really um, figure out what is going to help this person take their message as prescribed, their message, their medication as prescribed. You know, it's not always about reminders. Some people don't think that their disease is serious. Some people are worried about side effects or being addicted to a medication over the long term. Some people have problems with cost. Some people have reminders. So usually what we do is kind of randomly send people messages about everything. But by having people use electronic pill caps so we know if they're taking their medication that day and that week, we can adapt the message stream to that individual based on having this feedback so it addresses that individual's unique needs, concerns, and preferences. Right? So that's a very specific example. We're doing this study, uh, it happens to be in hypertension, but uh, we're also considering it with other colleagues here in the depression center um, with cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, for those of you that are familiar with CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy, there's a whole variety of skills that it tries to help people with who are depressed. Okay? You never really know. Usually what we do is we just try to teach people all of them because you don't know what's going to work with each, uh, what person, and that's just what a course of therapy looks like today. Okay? By using this mode and monitoring someone's mood, we hope to be able to figure out what types of skills are really the most effective and really most um, desired by which patients and which types of patients. So we can take what we're doing now and doing it, do it better, you know, be more effective and more efficient at the same time. So that's an example of how we can use reinforcement learning to make depression care better. So, um, you know, this is really has been kind of the ideal for those of us that are kind of geeky researchers, right? We want to make a robotic, automated system that can really, you know, um, do better than what we're doing now. But we've learned over many, many years that this is not what patients like. This is not what patients want, okay? And we don't think that we can make a system that will ever be as good as Dr. McGinnis. We all recognize that. But we're hoping we can do... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so let me stop there. Like I said, I'm happy to answer Wait a minute, it doesn't have a bow tie. Yeah. How <laughs> <laughs> you know it's not him? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's <not> today. Today. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true. Okay.
Yeah. You talked about the patient provides information, and you mentioned the uh, care partner program. I don't know if that is the label for the current work or prior work, but currently, how does the patient provide information? Yeah. Um, this is uh, one of the most important areas and one of the weakest links, in a sense, of these reinforcement learning applications in healthcare or with patient-centered care. Um, because in almost all the systems, some, you have to do something to provide inter information. You have to take the cap off the electronic pill bottle and put it on the thing, and it, that beams through the, the system. You have to report your depression score. Uh, as a response to a text message, which is a whole suite of uh, problems in and of itself. But the fundamental problem is that someone say someone with depression, the person who's likely to need the service the most is the one who's most likely to not want to respond and give all that feedback. Now, we heard a little bit about it before, but, and, 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 but we're really on, on the edge of having a lot of passive sensors. We heard about, you know, if you just have a cell phone in your pocket, it knows if you're up and moving around or if you're just sitting on the couch all day. It can know where you're going. So we talked just brainstorming with Dr. McGinnis for bipolar patients if they're in a manic episode. Are they spending a lot of time down in the mall? Right? Are they going and spending a lot of time at the bar? Um, are they driving too fast? These are passive sensors, right? So the person doesn't have to actively do something. We have a um, reinforcement learning uh, project for CBT for chronic pain. Similar sort of problem that patients have a pedometer and they have to report their step counts so that we know whether, um, you know whether our system should adapt to what they're doing, whether the CBT is working. So right now, I think that this is one of the weakest links. We're just trying to get in there uh, and learn something, but when we have more passive sensing, I think these will be even much more effective and many, many more channels uh, of measurement than one simple bit of data, like how many steps did you take or did you take the bottle off the, uh, the cap off the bottle? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the thing that comes to my mind in terms of using technology as an intermediary is it would seem to bring up violation of trust. Um, just to use it as an example, you mentioned the electronic monitor, did you take your meds? Um, I would think that, I would personally think, why are you trusting this thing instead of just asking me? Right. Um, the, sh the, the, the real answer uh, is that people really have a really tough time reporting their medication. I guess if I'm thinking, thinking out loud here, this is how I would explain it to someone it's really hard for us to remember a complex behavior. We think we know, but we don't always know. So it's not like I think you're gonna lie. And you say, did you take it every day for the last two weeks? People are really, we're just, our brains are not set up to remember things like that. So you can often get much more accurate data from something objective. Another example, maybe even a better one, is physical activity. People are typically, you know, how many steps did you take today? How many did I take? Who knows, right? Mm -hmm. And so you use, you know, a, a pedometers that can automatically upload. You can get better data. With that said, you know, the heart of your question is, is absolutely right. That we have to develop these things so people feel comfortable about it, so they don't feel like they're being big brother watched, right? Uh, and that they feel it's actually in their interest. So doing this in a collaborative way with patients. So for example, some of the data, like I, I mentioned, you know, because it was an offhand conversation, uh, might be very valuable. I think it's pretty sensitive. Are you going to the bar, right? You know, are you driving too fast? Do people really want to tell you those things? We need a lot of di dialogue. There's a lot of, it's like in general, uh, you know, people are willing to make trade-offs between privacy and getting more services, like say Facebook. Um, I, tell, I got all these off Google, all those pictures of this. <laughs> you don't say this at all, right? Yeah. They're just out there. I know. <laughs> but I with that said, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's yeah it's it's <laughs> My question deals with the um, care partner program. It sounds very intriguing. Is it a research program? Is it, cert is it only at the University of Michigan? Is it um, designated to a specific population? Um, I'm thinking students going off to university you know, getting enrolled in something like that. Could you describe the program, please? Yeah, 
Um, we've done the program in a variety of different contexts, and um, say we're specifically talking about the depression program now. Um, we, we went through a phase where we um, uh, offered it in many of the University of Michigan clinics, as well as some community clinics around Michigan. Right now, we're working with uh, other people in the Depression Center to integrate that better with some of the other things that are happening here at UM, and I'm specifically talking about MDOC and how to make these things available in the community. Um, so it's absolutely the goal to make these things available to the community. There's an organization called CHART, Center for Healthcare Research and Ta Transformation, and they're kind of one foot outside of UM, one foot in, and they're working with us on translation, how to take this research out into the real world and make it sustainable. Thank you, the lady yeah. back there that has the microphone. I have a mic. Um, I have a question related to the um, reinforcement learning and patient-centered care. Um, and what I'm, what I'm struggling with is if you are giving an intervention based on the past and predicting what, the, what would be good in the future, how do you account in the model for things like growth and new interests and maybe a change in the patient in that way? Um, that's a very good question. And uh, one way to think about it is reinforcement learning um, tries to balance two things. And it's called, uh, in reinforcement learning, exploitation and exploration. Real exploitation doesn't really work that good outside of engineering. but Basically, exploitation means I want to take advantage of the information I know and try things I know work. Now, even if someone wasn't changing, even if they weren't, if there are 20 things I could try, and I tried, th tried three of them, and say, well, this is the best of those three. I'm going to keep trying that. Okay? So I can't only exploit what I know. I have to continue to explore options. So you can kind of set that balance with reinforcement learning. And if, as someone evolves, you can still say, well, I'm pretty sure that this is what works for, for this person, but I'm going to still continue to explore. And you'll see that if you kind of are really conscious of, uh, of your site in Amazon or Netflix or whatever, once in a while there might be an oddball thing or something that's maybe two steps away from what you might like. And that's really what it's doing. It has to continue exploring to make sure it can optimize and do what's the best as the person is evolving. Uh, my question has to do with, with the technology. How do you determine, do you sign contracts with companies to provide equipment? Because when you talk about the phone in your pocket, kind of knowing where you are, and all of that would sort of depend on what equipment, what what services and everything you use, are they receptive to these kinds of things? Or are, are, who, are, who are the companies like a Verizon or a yeah. Motorola or whatever, are they open to these things? Do they work with you? Or do you just choose which phones you're going to use? Or? That's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. I'm like kind of looking at <laughs> Dr. McGinnis and, and laughing because he's, he's really uh, gone through the pain of working through those issues. If you do something, anything on the web, you have to rewrite the code to the person that they're using Safari, if they're using Internet Explorer, if they're using Firefox, it's always different. And as soon as one of those changes, it all breaks, right? So there's a lot of very, very complicated, difficult issues about implementation. Uh, to be honest, I mean, most of my work has been on the research side where we're trying to prove that these things actually can be of help, and then hopefully, you know, hand them off or partner with people that, that think uh, more about those things. But too often in the past, as academics, we've completely ignored those very, very concrete issues. And we write papers, and it looks great, and then no one sees it in the real world. So we're trying to do more implementation science, which is called translational science. Uh, but um, at the same time, we're trying to kind of continue moving ahead with, with, with the concepts. I don't know if you want to say something about your experience with the with the phones and the different versions. Yeah, we've worked with the number. We've worked well. The one particular phone company that we've worked with, we just selected them because their service was uh, relatively inexpensive, and and uh, that's how we went went forward with the in a practical sense. But I think there are two issues here. Really, is the you know the the development of new technology and patenting that. 
uh, you know, that's on one hand. And then the other hand is developing a service and a service oriented, you know, kind of a thing. And I don't uh, know exactly how the chips are going to fall going forward, but, you know, new technologies are so dynamic and evolving that, uh, you know, that, um, that it's hard to know, you know, where things are going to go. I, I just, you know, use the example of Thomas Edison. He gave out his light bulbs, you know, in the beginning and he sold the service, you know, with the electricity. So we may have something like that emerge. Um, uh, that, so I think there, there's one more question here. Uh, Are there any um, trends uh, nationwide of insurance companies um, compensating providers for mobile medicine? Um, yes, um, and one uh, general example is here in Michigan. We, uh, you know, I hesitate to say this, some we've made a bad experience with Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, but they tend to be one of the more enlightened insurers in the country in developing systems to incentivize and make possible patient-centered care. They really do. They've been a, a great backer of our depression, development of our depression care management program, and right now they're looking to co-fund a program for patients that have just left the hospital. Uh, as you probably know, I mean, about a third of the patients that leave the hospital here at UM are back in the hospital within 90 days. Terrible, terrible rate of recent readmission, and it's often because patients didn't know how to do the things to prevent that uh, subsequent acute episode. So, um, some of the things that a big insurer can do is to um, give providers uh, like a bump, a bonus, if they're doing certain things that they feel is good care for chronic disease management. And that's what Blue Cross is trying to do. It's called the Physician Group Incentive Program. And it's partly an incentive and it's partly just a, a fair compensation. If you're gonna do something like this, they say, you know what, that costs extra. So we're gonna give you an extra $10, $10 per patient per month or $5 per visit of a chronically ill patient. And then we're gonna watch. But if you have a this or a this or a this or a this, then you're an A plus organization and you're gonna get paid back at a higher rate, right? So that's what Blue Cross is trying to do. and. Um, uh, CMS, the, the federal agency that manages Medicare and Medicaid, also is looking to do some of these things through demonstration uh, under the Affordable Care Act. 